Hi there. Can you hear me? <gasps> you can hear me now. I want you to go up and down as you can because I'm looking at the audience. It's good if the camera can point towards the screen so that I would see what I'm doing. Can anyone hear me? Здравствуйте, доктор Краус. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Okay, I can hear you fine now. Thanks for the kind introduction. Some of it was true, <laughs> some small amount. But uh, I hope that people were able to see that poem that I put up um, there because I always like to have something for people to read when I'm being introduced. So you don't have to listen to the introduction. But if we can go to the next, uh, the next slide. This is a quote from a book that I really like, and I, uh, it, it, the initial mystery that attends any journey is how did the traveler reach his starting point in the first place? Really, that's what most mysteries are about, is how did we get to the point we are? And that's the mystery of the universe that, that, that motivates me as a scientist, is how did we get to the way we are? And so, if you go to the next slide. This is the way we are. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the most recent Hubble Deep Field surveys of the universe. Every dot in that picture, every single dot in that picture is not a star, but a galaxy. Each galaxy contains perhaps a hundred billion stars. And there are over a hundred billion galaxies in the, the observable universe. And when you look around, not only do you feel small, as we heard at the beginning of the introduction, but the natural question is, how did it all happen? And a question that's been around since really the dawn of civilization and has motiv motivated most of the religions of the world is the following question. If you go to the next slide. Why is there something rather than nothing? Because surely it would seem that to create a universe with a hundred billion galaxies, each containing a hundred billion stars, something or someone has to create it. You can't get all of that for nothing without some supernatural being. And of course, what I want to tell you about today is, as far as we can see, that's not the case. There's no need for any supernatural nonsense. You can create a universe with a hundred billion galaxies, a hundred billion stars, for free using the laws of physics. So let's talk about the ways you can answer the question. Let's go to the next slide. You can start this way, in the beginning, which is the words in English for the, the way the, the uh, Judeo-Christian Bible begins. That purports to give a description of how everything was created, but of course it doesn't explain anything. It has fairy tales that don't explain anything. They just, it's a nice story, and for some people pretty to listen to, but it doesn't explain anything. If we really ought to understand how we got here, we have to start exploring the universe out there, not the universe in our minds. And the real modern beginning of our understanding of the universe began in about 1929. If you go to the next slide. It began with the discovery by this gentleman here, in both of those pictures, one of my heroes, a man named Edwin Hubble. He's one of my heroes because uh, he gives me great hope for humanity. He began life as a lawyer and then became an astronomer. I don't know how many lawyers there are in the audience today, but I wanted to point out for each of you there's still hope to do something useful. In any case, what Hubble discovered in 1929 surprised him and the world. If you go to the next slide, this is a, a picture. It's not a picture of sperm. It's a picture of galaxies as I've drawn them. And what Hubble discovered by looking out, first of all, in 1926, he actually discovered our galaxy was not the only galaxy in the universe. Until 1926, the entire universe, as far as science was concerned, was contained in our Milky Way galaxy. 
that's a single hu human lifetime ago. My mother was alive and is still alive, but was alive in 1926. And before that, the entire universe was one single galaxy. Now we know there are 100 billion galaxies, so everything has changed. That discovery by Hubble in 1926 was very important, but the next, next one he made in 1929 was more important. He discovered, much to his surprise, that when you look out at distant galaxies, on average, they're all moving away from us. And the galaxies that are twice as far away from us are moving twice as fast. And the ones that are three times as far away from us are moving three times as fast. And so on. This was a remarkable discovery. Now, when you look at this, the first thing that comes to your mind is, well, it looks like we're the center of the universe. And everything is moving away from us. That's certainly what it feels like for most of us. Most of us feel on a daily basis like we're the center of the universe. But part of growing up is discovering that we're not the center of the universe. And part of the growing up of science was to discover that we're not the center of the universe here. The picture we see is only because we are located where we are. And the, if you want to see what it really means, you have to step outside of our universe. But most of us can't do that very easily. So for your benefit, I've drawn a simple universe that we can step outside of. So if you go to the next slide. I've drawn two universes here with, where I put a point where each galaxy is nice and uniform. And at one time, that region of the universe has a certain size, as you can see in the white circles. Each of the galaxies is located at a certain distance apart. But oh, no, don't go next. Don't, don't go ahead of me here. Hold on. There we go. The next moment, you can see that uh, on the red, at a later time, the whole universe has expanded. Now, what would you see if you were on any given galaxy? So let's go to the next slide. Let's pick one galaxy. There. Let's say we're at that galaxy. To see what you would see if you were sitting at that galaxy, what I have to superimpose the second image on top of the first image, putting that galaxy on top of So let's go to the next slide. And I've done that. And what you can see is if you're sitting in that galaxy and you look out, you see exactly what Hubble saw. Everything is moving away from you. And the, and the galaxies that are twice as far away are moving twice as fast. They'd move twice as fast in that given time. Those that are three times as far away have moved three times as much in the given time. And you see exactly what Hubble saw. So what Hubble saw, told what Hubble's observation tells us, is that the universe is expanding. And it doesn't matter what galaxy you're sitting on. You see the same thing. Let's go to the next slide. Pick a different galaxy. The next slide. Take that one. Now the next slide. Again, from there, if you were sitting on that galaxy, you'd see exactly the same thing. And you'd see the same thing from every galaxy in the universe. So what Hubble discovered, much to his surprise, was that the universe was expanding. And this changed everything. Because until that point, until 1929, science thought the universe had been around forever, was static and eternal. But suddenly, we discovered the universe was expanding. And if that's the case, then we can work backwards and ask, what happened yesterday? Well, yesterday the universe was a little smaller, and the day before, and the day before. And we can work backwards, and we now know that about a little over 13.7 billion years ago, all of the galaxies we now see in our universe were together at a single point, a point we now call the Big Bang that our universe had a finite beginning. And that changed everything. If our universe began, the next question is, how will it end? And if it's expanding, what will happen to that expansion? Will the expansion go on forever? Or will it stop one day? That, by the way, is the question that got me into cosmology as a physicist. It was the question I wanted to answer many years ago when I started out doing physics. What universe do we live in? Because I wanted to be the first person to know how the universe would end. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Now, to answer that question, we use physics. So if you can go to the next slide. It turns out, one of the wonderful things that Einstein told us is that space is actually curved due to gravity. 
we it's hard to picture it because of course you can't picture a curved three-dimensional universe so I've drawn here curved two-dimensional universes which we can picture so these are not our universe but they're two-dimensional images but it turns out they represent very well the three possibilities for our universe it turns out that the middle universe is a closed universe in this case a two-dimensional sphere but our universe could be a three-dimensional sphere there could be enough stuff to cause space to curve in upon itself and in such a closed universe if you looked out very far in one direction you'd see the back of your head eventually light would go around the universe and come back to you now there are other universes we could live in what's called an open universe and a flat universe and they look very nice and and they're hard to picture in a three-dimensional perspective but you can picture them in a two-dimensional perspective here but what really matters is the laws of general relativity tell us that a universe full of matter in a universe full of matter the middle universe say if it's closed if you look at the right curve it will expand and eventually collapse again an open universe will expand forever at a finite rate as you can see from the top picture and a flat universe will expand but slow down and eventually stop but only after an infinite amount of time so if we could determine which universe we live in an open closed or flat universe we would be able to know the future how do you determine whether we're in an open closed or flat universe well the shape of the universe, the geometry of the universe, depends upon the total amount of stuff in it. If I don't have very much stuff, I'll live in an open universe. If I have a lot of stuff, space will close in on itself and I'll live in a closed universe. And the boundary between those two is an exactly flat universe. So all we have to do is weigh the universe and then we'll be able to know the future. And that's what got me into cosmology. Now, it's not so easy to weigh the universe, but in fact, I've written two whole books about it. But it turns out a picture is worth a thousand words. It turns out we've been able to weigh the universe. And to describe that, I want to go back in time a little bit. So if we can go to the next slide. I want to go back to 1936 to the, science, to the journal Science. Don't stop, stop, stop pressing the button. Okay, stop. Wait till I tell No, stop. Go back. Okay. <laughs> the journal Science. That's a very distinguished science journal. And there appeared an article. If you now make a click, just one click. An article appeared called Lens Like Action of a Star by the Deviation of Light in a Gravitational Field. It sounds like a very fancy, fancy word, uh, title. It doesn't tell you what it means. But then the abstract, I want to click and make the next click. Here was how the article was described. I find this so funny. It begins by saying, some time ago, R.W. Mandel paid me a visit and asked me to publish the results of a little calculation, which I had made at his request. This note complies with his wish. It was a kinder, gentler time back then, and I looked out at the audience earlier and I saw students, and some of you students will become scientists, and some of you will submit articles to the journal Science, and you'll be rejected. <laughs> and you'll try again. But I guarantee you that if today you tried to submit an article that looked like that with that kind of abstract, it would never make it in. But that abstract was sent by a very distinguished scientist. If you make the next click. Click, yeah. It was submitted by Albert Einstein. And so they gave him a little leeway. And what Einstein, the article was about uh, something he had discovered, but he thought it was so unimportant he never even wanted to publish it. He discovered that if space is curved, then if you have a heavy object like a star and another object, a bright object behind that star, the light from that star will, will pass the, the, the intervening star and it'll be bent, it'll be curved, and it'll come back to you, and that star can act like a lens. And that lens can magnify things, just like my glasses do, or if I had a cut glass goblet, like if I look through this crystal here, I see many images of you. And so space itself can act like a lens. But he thought it was completely unimportant. And so he forgot about it. In fact, if you, go to, if you make one more click, here was the calculation 
he published that Mr. Mandel asked him to publish. But it turned out, if you go back, that's from 1936. If you go back in his notebooks to 1914, if you make another click, please, you'll discover that there was the exact same calculation done in 1914, but he'd forgotten he'd done it because he thought it was so unimportant. And later on, he wrote, after the article was published, he wrote to the editor, and if you click again, please, he said, let me thank you for your cooperation with the little publication which Mr. Mandel squeezed out of me. It is of little value, but it makes the poor guy happy. And that's how science is done. He thought it was unimportant. But that, ob but that phenomena of gravitational lensing turns out to be incredibly important. Because Einstein didn't know about galaxies. He thought about stars, and he said the stars will bend light by such a small amount we'll never ever see it. But in fact, galaxies could do something very different. And if, let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of the phenomena that Einstein described, which he thought would never be observed. If you look here, every, Im every dot in this image, again, is a galaxy, not a star. This is a cluster of galaxies. All the yellow dots, big, big dots, are a cluster of galaxies. Almost all galaxies live in clusters. The distance from one end of this image to the other is about 10 million light years across. 10 million light years. It light, takes light 10 million years to travel across that. But there are many galaxies in that cluster. There's a lot of mass. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see in that picture there are images of these faint blue objects, many different blue objects on the lower part and the upper part. They're, they're, they're squeezed out. It turns out those are multiple images of a single galaxy located five billion light years behind that cluster. We would never even be able to see that galaxy except the light from that galaxy was lensed and it was magnified and it was stretched and many different images of the same galaxy are now seen. All those different images are the same object and we're seeing them because they've passed through that ga intervening galaxy and the light has been lensed and magnified and twisted and, and it's an amazing image of exactly what Einstein predicted. But what's more interesting is we can use the general relativity to say, well, how much mass is in that intervening galaxy and how is it distributed in order to see that image, in order to reproduce that image? It's a very complicated mathematical problem. It's called a mathematical inversion, but you can do it. And in the late 1990s, uh, uh, physicists at then Bell Laboratories in the United States did that. And let's go to the next image. This is a picture of where the mass is in that, uh, in that ga intervening galaxy. The, the, the spikes are where the galaxies are, you can, where the galaxies that you can see are. But if you look, you can see a huge mountain of mass in between the galaxies, where the galaxies aren't. And around each galaxy, you can see another mountain of, of mass. Around this, each spike, you can see a mountain of mass. It turns out there's 40 times as much matter in that image as you can see with your eye. There's 40 times as much matter as can be accounted by visible galaxies. Most of the mass of that cluster is invisible. It doesn't shine. And for that reason, physicists, when, they, when we've discovered that, call that material dark matter. And what we've discovered is that every galaxy, 10 times as much mass as invisible light, exists in this dark matter. Every galaxy is dominated by dark matter. And if there's so much of it, we have now realized that there's no way it can be made up of normal things like protons and neutrons, the stuff that makes up you and me. We believe it's made of some new type of elementary particle, something we wouldn't see here on Earth. And what's very exciting is, if that's the case, the dark matter that dominates the mass of the universe is not just out there in the cosmos, it's right in this room. It's right in the room where you're sitting as you fall asleep while I'm talking. And that means we can build experiments here on Earth to look for it. For example, go to the next slide. Here's one type of experiment that actually I proposed many years ago. 
and it's being done in deep mines under uh, underground all around the world. All you have this, this what what is pictured there is a silicon block, the same kind of thing. Actually, that's germanium. The same kind of thing that that makes up computer chips in the computers that run your phones and your computers. All you have to do is cool that little block down to one one thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. And then dark matter particles are streaming through this room and through that detector. And every now and then, most of the dark matter particles will go right through the Earth without even knowing it was there. But every now and then, one dark matter particle will bounce off an atom in that detector, depositing a little bit of energy, heating up the whole thing by one one thousandth of a degree. And so there are detectors being built all around the world to look for that kind of dark matter. So far, they haven't seen any. And the reason is maybe it, it doesn't interact once a year. Maybe it interacts once a hundred years. So you have to build a bigger detector. And bigger detectors are being built. And what's really exciting is that maybe the, there's another way to look for dark, that kind of dark matter. Maybe we won't look at particles that were created at the beginning of the universe. But maybe we can create them in the laboratory today. And at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider, the machines are being built that will pr smash together particles, hoping to create new particles. And maybe the first place we'll see these dark matter particles is when we create them in the lab. There's a race from these underground detectors and at CERN to see who's the first experiment that can detect dark matter directly in the laboratory. It's surely a Nobel Prize. But if we detect it, it will tell us what the particles are that make up most of the matter in the universe. Because what we've now learned is that most of the matter of the universe is made of something else. So the first really important lesson you should have from this lecture is that you're even more insignificant than you thought you were. We're just one galaxy of 100 billion galaxies, but it turns out even all the galaxies and all the stuff that makes you and I up is insignificant compared to this dark matter. And that dark matter is really a, a fundamentally responsible for our existence. So we hope one day soon we'll detect these dark matter. But really, it, for our purposes today, it doesn't matter what it is. It just depends on how much of it there is. So go to the next slide, please. Let's go back to that. What we can do from looking at that at that cluster is we can weigh that cluster. We can weigh how much dark matter there is. And since clusters, every galaxy is inside of a cluster, we can basically determine how much total mass there is in the universe by just weighing each cluster of galaxies and then adding up all the numbers of clusters of galaxies we see in the universe. And when we do that, and we've done that, we come up with something special. Please click. Now. That stuff at the bottom of the slide may mean nothing to you. But when physicists see this, they go, wow, they jump up and down. This quantity called omega, it's a Greek letter on the left, that represents the total amount of matter in the universe. But it represents it in a very special way. It represents the fraction of the amount of matter needed to result in a flat universe that is contained in the universe today. So if omega is 1, if we measured omega to be 1, that would mean the universe would be exactly flat. But what we discovered is if we add up all the matter in the universe, including dark matter, there's only 30% of the amount of matter needed to make a flat universe. That would seem to suggest our universe is open. And that would suggest it will expand forever. But of course, there's a big loophole. This is just the matter around galaxies. What about the matter away from galaxies? How can we measure that? We can't, we can't measure it by using galaxies as probes. Well, we can actually try and measure the geometry of the universe directly. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes. So next slide. And the answer is we can. OK, go to the next slide. If you look at these universes, you notice something. If we draw a triangle in the flat universe, then the sum of the angles of the triangle is 180 degrees, as any Russian student knows, and hardly any American students know. 
Because I'm sure your math teaching is better there than here. If you look at an open universe, what you discover is that light rays, uh, straight lines bend outward. And the sum of the angles in a triangle is less than 180 degrees. And in a closed universe, the sum of the angles, the, the ang light rays bend inwards, and if you look at it, the sum of the angles will be greater than 180 degrees. So if we could just draw a big enough triangle and measure the, the angles, we could measure the geometry of the universe directly. Let's go to the next slide. Well, to do that, you have to take a big picture of the universe. And this is the biggest picture of the universe we have. This is something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is radiation that's been coming to us from the Big Bang. And so if we look out at the universe, we see galaxies. And if we kept look, and of course, the farther away we look, the further back in time we're looking, because it takes so long to get. Now, since our since our universe is 13.8 billion years old, you might think if you looked out 13.8 billion light years away, you'd see the Big Bang. But you can't see the Big Bang, because between us and the Big Bang, there's a wall. Namely. At very early times, the universe was so hot and dense that light couldn't escape. But as the universe cooled down, when the universe was 300,000 years old, suddenly it became, what happened is matter became neutral and not very dense, and suddenly light could propagate throughout the universe without being trapped. And when we look out, Sorry, I can't search the web on Apple. when we look out at the universe, when we look back in time, we look back at time, and the farthest we can see is that moment when the universe first became transparent. And that radiation will be coming to us from that time. But because the universe has been expanding, it turns out the radiation gets cooler and cooler and cooler. And that radiation was discovered by accident by two people who didn't know what the hell they were doing in 1965. They discovered this background of radiation, thermal radiation, at three degrees above absolute zero. And they won the Nobel Prize for that because it was later realized they discovered the radiation from the Big Bang. But since then, we've tried to get an image of what that radiation looks like because if we look out in all directions and we get an image, we'll get a picture of what the universe looked like when it was only 300,000 years old. And this is, this is a baby picture of the universe. Now, to understand what it means, it's a projection of a sphere. So to understand that, let's go to the next slide. Here's a projection of a sphere that you're all familiar with. And it's a, it's, so we project a sphere on a, on, on a plane, and you get that. Of course, we're very northern hemisphere cent centric, so go to the next slide. I always like to show it this way because my wife uh, was from Australia. And we, all, we, we in the Northern Hemisphere always put you know, Russia and North America up at the top, but I like to think of uh, 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 Australia there on the top. But that doesn't matter. The point is that's a projection of a three-dimensional plane. And let's go back now to the next slide. The next slide. The, uh, what I've done is I've made the same projection across the sky. So if you look at the top of that picture, you're looking up. And if you look at the bottom of the picture, you're looking down, basically. And what you see, that what this is, is, a, is the temperature of the universe as measured in all directions. And you see hot spots, red spots, and blue spots, cold spots. This, represents, this shows us that in the early universe, there were regions that had a little more matter than average and a little less matter than average. Now, these deviations are very, very small. The hot spots in that picture are only one thousandth of a degree cold, hotter than the cold spots in that picture. But this is a baby picture of the universe, and these hot spots and cold spots would later collapse to form all the galaxies we see in the universe today. So it's an amazing image, and this image also won a Nobel Prize. But we can actually use this image to measure, measure the geometry of the universe. I'll show you how. Let's go to the next slide. So that 
that surface that I show at the top is where that light is coming to us from. And that light is coming to us through the galaxies uh, to our detector here on Earth. And it, and it was emitted when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old. Okay? Now, when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old, light, nothing could travel faster than light. And nothing could travel, therefore, faster than a few hundred thousand light years. Now, what I show in the upper left-hand corner is how big a slice that's a few hundred thousand light years across would be on that image. It's about that surface. That's, that's, uh, that's a hundred thousand light years across. Now, gravity travels at the speed of light. And that means if I have a lump that's smaller than that, than one degree across, okay, smaller than that size, gravity can travel across it in a hundred thousand years and it knows it's a lump. So it knows to collapse. But if I had a lump of matter that's bigger than that size across, it doesn't even know it's a lump. It can't collapse because gravity hasn't traveled across it. It doesn't know it's supposed to collapse. And so the biggest lumps we should see in that picture are that size, are 100,000 light years across. But whether that 100,000 light years is one degree or not will depend upon what kind of universe we live. Go to the next slide. And just for a second, go to the next slide, because I want to go, yeah, because this is that picture I showed you before. If you look at that, look at the flat universe, if you imagine one side of that triangle is 100,000 light years across, then the angle that would be spanned by your eye in that uh, triangle is one degree across. But in the closed universe, if that, if that, if, if one side of that triangle is 100,000 light years across, and you were looking at it from the other end of the triangle, you'd see something that's bigger than one degree. And if you looked at the universe, you'd see something smaller than one degree. So go back again to the slide before. Here is the universe we actually see. It was taken by an experiment called the boomerang experiment. We can make universes, model universes on a computer and we can say, how big would the biggest lumps we can see look if the universe were closed? And that's the figure on the left. And those lumps are bigger than the lumps in the universe we actually see. How about in an open universe? Well, the lump, biggest lumps would be smaller than we actually see. But just like Goldilocks, I don't know if you have the Goldilocks fairy tale in, in Russia, but just like Goldilocks, it, if you look at a flat universe, it's just right. The model flat universe on the bottom there that we make on a, on a computer has lumps that are exactly the size that we see in the universe we actually observe. And that it now tells us to an accuracy of better than 1% that our universe is exactly flat. But now, if you were listening to me, there's a problem. Because a few minutes ago, I showed you that if you add up all the matter in the universe, it only accounts for 30% of what would be needed to make an exactly flat universe. That means 70% of the mass of our universe is somehow missing from that picture. If our actual universe is flat, it can't be in galaxies or around galaxies like that. Well, where could it be? It could reside in nothing in empty space. Now that sounds ridiculous, except in the modern picture of the world, empty space isn't so empty. Let's go to the next slide. And the next one after that. This animation that you're looking at is actually a computer animation of, of what the universe looks like on very small scales. This is actually a picture inside of a proton of what we calculate is happening. And because of the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity, it turns out empty space isn't empty. It's a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that pop in and out of existence on a time scale so short you can't even see them. They, they're called virtual particles. 
they exist for time scales so short you can't observe them, but they're there. And in fact, we now understand that in order to calculate the mass of a proton properly, you have to include all of these virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence. Well, if they're there inside of a proton, maybe they're popping in and out of existence in empty space, and maybe they could give empty space energy. Okay, so maybe empty space could actually weigh something. That's remarkable. It means you get rid of everything you can see, but it still weighs something. But we could calculate from first principles, we could guess how much energy empty space might have in this kind of analysis. And when we do that, we come up with an answer that's shown on the next slide. We come up with an answer that the energy of empty space should be roughly a gazillion times the energy of everything we see in the universe. And we know that can't be the case. That's the worst prediction in all of physics. We predict that it should be 120 orders of magnitude larger than the energy of all galaxies and all the matter, including dark matter in the universe. And if that were the case, we wouldn't be here. This is the worst prediction in all of physics. And it's been around since I was a graduate student. And, and many of us tried to figure out what's wrong with this calculation. But the simple assumption was that, look, it can't be as large as that. But it can't be, there's no way you can cancel a number that big to 120 decimal places and leave something non-zero in the 121st decimal place. So we assumed that there must be some miracle of, of mathematics that would cancel out all these virtual particles and the energy of empty space would be precisely zero, a sensible value. That's how we were able to go to sleep at night. So all of us assumed that the energy of empty space was zero and this calculation was vastly wrong and somehow we'd have some new insights that would allow us to do the calculation correctly. I spent many years trying to figure out how to do the calculation correctly, as did other people. But the good news is we don't have to rely on theorists to predict things. We can try and measure it. We could try and measure the energy of empty space. If it's there, we should be able to measure it. How can we measure it? Well, go to the next slide. It turns out the amazing thing is that if you put energy in empty space, it's gravitationally repulsive. If you put energy, any other kind of energy in the universe, in matter and radiation, it's gravitationally attractive. It wants to, it wants to collapse. Gravity sucks, as my students used to say. But if you put energy in empty space, then gravity blows. Gra it's, it's, it, it, it's repulsive. It's a kind of cosmic anti-gravity. So all we have to do is measure the expansion of the universe and, and, and measure the rate at which it's, is it slowing down or speeding up. Now, when these measurements were made, everyone assumed, since the universe is made of matter, that the universe must be slowing down. And if we measure the rate at which it's expanding over time, we'll see a curve like the curve on the bottom of that picture. Well, it took a long time to be able to measure things, but we've been able to do it. Let's go to the next picture. This is the picture that Hubble first got in 1929 when he measured the velocity of galaxies versus their distance. And you see, although it was really the fact that he drew a straight line through that data set was completely inappropriate because there's no way that we can say that a straight line would do that. He guessed that it was a straight line, that velocity was proportional to distance. He actually got the answer a factor of 10 wrong, and that was quite interesting. But I won't go into that. I'll, ha I'll talk about that in the question period if you want. But that was back then, and we've been able to do much better. The problem is these are only nearby galaxies. If we want to measure the expansion rate of the universe out to long distances away, and therefore long times ago, we have to use something other than galaxies, something that's brighter, and something whose distance we can measure. And in the last 20 years, we've been able to find such an object. Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of a galaxy long, long ago, far, far away. Well, not that long ago and not that far away. It's only about 70 million light years away. It's a galaxy that looks just like our own. It's a spiral galaxy containing about 100 billion stars. And you notice that, well, it's very bright at the center. There's about 10 billion stars at the center. But if you look in the lower part of that picture, you see a bright object. 
And that looks about as bright as the whole center of that galaxy. Now, the first thing you might assume is that, it, that, that, that that really is just a star in our galaxy that got in the way of the picture. But it's not. It turns out it's a star at the edge of that galaxy. And it's burning with the brightness of 10 billion stars. How is that possible? It's a star that's just exploded. A supernova. When stars explode, they shine with the brightness of 100 billion stars or more. And they're the brightest fireworks in the universe. And we, what we're seeing there is an exploding star in that galaxy. Now, stars don't explode very often in galaxies, happily for, our, for us. Stars explode about once per 100 years per galaxy. Now, it turns out these exploding stars are exactly the probes that we need to use to be able to measure the expansion rate of the universe. But if they just explode once per 100 years per galaxy, how can we measure them? Well, the first thing you might imagine is it's quite simple. We assign a graduate student to each galaxy, and we have them look at that galaxy continuously for their whole life to see if a star explodes. 100 years is about the right time for a PhD. Hi, that's OK. Graduate students are cheap. We can get another one. But we don't have to do that, happily. Because, the, because there are so many galaxies in our universe, if you took a region of the sky about the size of, say, one of your old kopecks, I was at a museum in Moscow a few years ago where I saw some old kopecks, and they were about that big. If you took a region, if you took your hand and looked at a region of the sky at night where there were no stars about that size, with the biggest telescopes on Earth, in such a region that's that small, you could see about 100,000 galaxies. And that means if, it, if one galaxy explodes every 100 years, but you're looking at 100,000 galaxies, in a region that size, you should see, on average, one galaxy explode every night. And that's exactly what astronomers have done. They've looked with big telescopes out of the sky and been able to measure exploding stars almost every night when they look at it. So let's go to the next slide. This is a movie, and it will replay over and over again, of a star exploding in that particular galaxy. When stars explode, they get bright for about a month, and then they get dumped and dim again. Now, when that star explodes, it turns out, for reasons I'm not going to go into now, that we believe we understand exactly how bright that exploding star gets. But, of course, we're looking at it through a telescope, and we see how bright it looks through that telescope, and that tells us how far away the galaxy is. And this allows us to measure the distance to distant galaxies that are across the whole visible universe. And then we measure how fast those galaxies are moving away from us. And we've got those two things. We've got, we now know how far the galaxy is away from us and how fast it's moving away from us. And when, it, when we know how far it is away from us, we know how long ago we, the observation was made. And therefore, we can measure the rate of expansion of the universe over time. And that was done by a number of groups in 1998. And they made a discovery that surprised them tremendously. Go to the next slide. This is a picture which may not look very impressive. But this is measuring that Hubble spot out looking at distant supernovae over the, over the entire, as far as we can see. And what I've done in the, in the bottom part of that is draw a straight line through that data set and then make the straight line horizontal. So if you look at the bottom part of that, if the, universe, if the expansion rate of the universe was always the same, you'd lie in a horizontal straight line. Now what everyone expected was that all those supernovae in the right-hand side of that picture would lie on the lower curve because the universe was decelerating. But what they discovered to their absolute surprise was that the supernovae were lying in the, uh, above the straight line on average. And that it would only be the case if the expansion of the universe is actually speeding up, if the universe is accelerating. What can make the universe accelerate? The energy of empty space. And if just for fun you try and fit that data and ask how much energy would you have to put in empty space to fit that curve, if, if you look at the, you'll see that it, what you need is exactly what we're missing. 
If you put 70% of the energy of the universe in empty space, then you fit the data exactly. And that is crazy. It means most of the energy of the universe resides in nothing. And astronomers were incredibly surprised. In fact, it was so surprising that the people who, who, who took this data, even though they had no idea what they were looking for, won the Nobel Prize in 2011 for discovering the strangest thing about the universe, that the universe is accelerating and that the dominant energy of the universe resides in empty space. Actually, several of us had predicted it some time ago and were very happy when it was discovered, although we weren't so happy when the people who discovered it won the Nobel Prize instead of us, but that's life. They were the first people to convince the world that this was true. So, this means that nothing is incredibly important. Empty space is far more important than you would have thought. So let's go to the next slide. It's so important that it's virtually everything. So please click once. We've discovered that the dominant energy in the universe resides in empty space. Click again. We have no idea why it's there. Because remember, I told you our calculations give completely the wrong answer. We have no understanding of why empty space weighs something, but it does. You get rid of all the radiation and matter and empty something, and we don't have the slightest idea why. Next, click. Its very existence is probably tied to the nature of space and the origin of our universe, and we hope we'll understand it one day, but we don't right now. Next, click. But most important, it will determine our future. Because you remember I said I got into cosmology because I wanted to know how the universe would end. And I thought if there was enough matter, it would cause the universe to recollapse or, or, or not. But now it determines that, it, it, determines, it, it turns out that my reason to get into cosmology was, was misplaced. Because matter is irrelevant. What will determine the future of the universe isn't even geometry. It's the energy of empty space. Because once you put energy in empty space, even a closed universe will expand forever. And so it looks like that energy of empty space will determine our future. It looks like our universe will continue to expand forever and ever and ever. And getting colder and darker. And therefore, our future will be determined by literally the energy of nothing. But really, to determine our future, Let's, let's go back to high school physics and go to the next slide. To determine how the universe will really end, you may re we, we can ask the question that high school physics cl classes ask all the time. Take a coin like I have here. I'm trying to, there we go. And throw it up. It comes down. If I throw it up higher, it, it comes down eventually. But if I throw it up really high, it doesn't come down at all. And in physics classes, we teach students how to determine that's the case. If you can click once. We say that coin has energy. And some of this may be a beautiful equation for some of you. Some, for some of you, this may bring back awful memories of high school physics classes. But it turns out it doesn't matter the shape of the, 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 what all that means. It turns out the, the, what's really important, make another click, is that when I throw a coin up, it has a positive piece, and that comes from the speed of the coin. And it has a neg another click, please. It has a negative piece, and that comes from the mass that's pulling the coin back. And click again. All we, it turns out we turn out physics into accounting. Because if we add up the energy of that coin and add up the positive piece and the negative piece, if it's positive, if the total energy is positive, the coin will escape. If the total energy is negative, the coin will come back to Earth. And it turns out we could do that for the universe as well. Go to the next slide, please. Here's a picture of a region of the universe. And, we're, and say our galaxy is the center of it. Let's look at a galaxy at the edge of that region, the one where I have a question mark. If the universe is the same everywhere, then whatever happens to that galaxy will happen to all galaxies. So in order to determine what the future of the universe would be, we just have to determine the future of that galaxy. 
But to determine the future of that galaxy, we just do the high school physics question. We ask, what is its total energy? Well, its total energy has two pieces, as you can see in the, in the, in the figures below. The first piece, labeled A, is the energy of its motion. It's moving away from us. That gives a positive piece to its total energy. B, however, is the negative energy of the, of the piece, which comes from the energy of all the galaxies that are pulling it back in. And all we have to do is determine whether the total energy of that galaxy is positive or negative. Another way to write that is if B is bigger than A, the negative piece is bigger than the positive piece, then the galaxy will come back and, and fall in towards us and the universe will collapse. If B over A is less than 1, the universe will expand forever. And it turns out, amazingly, that this ratio, B over A, is exactly the quantity omega that I talked about earlier. And we've already measured omega, and we've measured omega now to be exactly 1, because we live in a flat universe. And if, we, if, if omega is exactly 1, then B is exactly equal to A. And if B is exactly equal to A, the positive energy of every galaxy is exactly canceled by the negative energy of every galaxy. The total energy of every galaxy, the gravitational energy, is precisely zero. And therefore, if we live in a flat universe, we live in a universe where the total ener gravitational energy of every object, the gravitational energy, the classical Newtonian gravitational energy of every object, is zero. And that suggests something very important. If you were going to create a universe from nothing, what would you make the total energy of every galaxy? Zero. It suggests that it's possible to have the ultimate free lunch. Because gravity has a positive piece and a negative piece, it's possible to have a universe with zero total energy that still has a lot of stuff in it. So now, as we think about a possible universe from nothing, that's our picture of the universe as we understand it. Now let's think about the implications of that in the last few minutes. You'll be pleased to know the last few minutes of this talk. Let's go to the next slide. There are many different kinds of nothing. When we talk about nothing, we have to be careful. And many people complain that we don't define nothing very well. So the first kind of nothing I want to talk about is just empty space. Well, that kind of nothing is not really nothing after all. Go to the next slide. Because as I've told you, empty space is really a bubbling, boiling brew of virtual particles. And it turns out, due to the laws of quantum, quantum mechanics and gravity, if I start out with empty space having nothing in it, and I let particles burp, burp, burp in and out of existence, if I wait long enough, space will actually fill up with stuff. So it's, you, you, if you ask, how can we get something from nothing, the answer is, we always will if we wait long enough. In a universe of empty space, if we wait long enough, the laws of quantum mechanics will eventually produce real particles. So empty space isn't empty. In that kind of universe, it's really easy to make something from nothing. But you might say, OK, well, that's not nothing, because you still have empty space. Where did the empty space come from? Well, let's go to the next slide. The nothing number two, make and click again. Yeah. It turns out if you allow, if you, that, okay, stop there. If you, if you put, allow quantum mechanics to apply to gravity, then not only can particles pop in and out of space, but space itself can pop in and out of existence. Because gravity is a theory of space and time. And if you allow quantum mechanics to apply to gravity, you can create universes that can pop in an They appear and disappear. Okay, come back to... You can go back to me so I can wave my hand some more. Okay. Now, the only universe that you can exp it, it, oh, don't don't no, go back go back come on don't jump ahead. Okay. Good. If we most universes that get created from nothing that pop into existence will disappear again they'll collapse in an instant. Okay. The only ones that universes that could spontaneously appear and continue to appear forever that ha are ones that have zero total energy. Because if you start with nothing and have zero energy, the only thing that can survive for, forever is something that has 
universe you could create spontaneously from nothing is one that has zero total energy. Well, it turns out the only kind of universe that ha we know has zero total energy is a closed universe. Well, that seems to be a problem. Go to the next slide. Click once. But our universe is flat. We don't appear to live in a closed universe. So maybe our universe wasn't created from nothing. Click again. It turns out that if we create a closed universe from nothing, generally it'll collapse in a fraction of a second. The only way to make a closed universe last long enough to last 14 billion years is, is if at the very beginning of the universe we have another time when the universe is dominated by the energy of empty space and it expands very, very fast. It turns out that is just what particle physics predicted, particle physicists predicted 30 years ago is characteristic for our universe. That was called inflation. Make another click. In 1981, a physicist named Alan Guth argued that given what we know about the universe, there should be a very early period of rapid expansion, which he called inflation. Go to the next slide. And this is the history of our universe. And click on it, please. This is the history of our universe. We're, we're observing it today at the very right-hand side, expanding. But physicists say that at, at very early times in the early history of the universe, when the universe was a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old, there was a period of rapid expansion called inflation. Now, just like if you blow a balloon up very big, if it gets very, very big, it'll look flat. Like our Earth looks flat. If you're on the tundra in Siberia, it looks flat. But of course, it's round. So if you blow the, if inflation happened, it will make a closed universe look like it's flat. And, and if you go to the next slide, Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, go back a second before I hypnotize you. Go back, please. It turns out the, that, therefore, the only universe we, that, that, that we would expect to have that could be created from nothing that would survive for 14 billion years is a universe that had an early period of inflation. And if it had an early period of inflation, then it would look flat. So the only we would expect to be able to see that could be created nothing would look flat today, just, just like our universe. Well, that's a story, but how do we know if inflation really happened? It turns out there may be a way to measure it in your lifetime, in my lifetime. And now I'll go to a uh, click on this slide. I'm putting that picture not just to hypnotize you, but it turns out that's what's actually happening in this room. Whenever I move my arms around, or any of you shuffle, Einstein tells us that we create something called a gravitational wave, a ripple in space. And every time I do this, I create ripples in space. Einstein predicted them in 1916, and, as, and, and, and they've been around. We we've know that they're there, but gravity is so weak, we never thought we'd be able to detect them. Click again. When I make a... When I wave my arms, I create a gravitational wave going out at the speed of light, and it causes space to literally expand and contract. And in the room in which you're sitting, that's happening all the time. But the ripples are so small that you don't even notice them. I mean, you may think the room is expanding and contracting if you have too much vodka last night, but assuming you didn't, the room seems, a, a reason, the room seems like a constant size. But it's actually expanding and contracting all the time. And we never thought we'd be able to measure it. But some bold physicists decided they'd try. And go to the next slide. This is the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's in Hanford, Washington. And there's another one just like it in Louisiana, in the United States. It consists of two tunnels, each three kilometers long, at right angles to each other. And it was reasoned that if a gravitational wave came through this detector, then one arm would get a little bit smaller, and the other arm 
would get a little bit bigger. And then, and then one would get smaller and one would get bigger. And, and it would do just like I showed you in that early figure. The problem is the amount by which it would, the length of these puddles arms would change is minuscule. Gravitational waves are very weak. And to get a strong gravitational wave, you have to get a strong, violent event. What's the most violent event we know happening in the universe today? When two massive black holes, each more massive than the sun, collide. Well, if such black holes exist in our galaxy or other galaxies, and we didn't know if they did, they would collide very rarely. But even if we could calculate that two massive black holes collided and produced gravitational waves, we would show, we calculated, that it, by the time they got to Earth, they would change the length of one of those tunnels compared to the other by an amount equal to one one-thousandth the size of a proton. And therefore, people like me figured this experiment would never work. How could you measure a distance, and ch a change in distance of one one-thousandth the size of a proton? Well, these experimenters did it, and I don't have time to tell you about it. But two years ago, what happened was, if you go to the next slide, there was a bang that was heard around the world. And click, please. It may not look like much, but in the two different detectors in, in Hanford, Washington, and, and Louisiana, a signal was seen that was identical in both of them. And, and the reason you want to have two is there's lots of noise. But, one ex but if, an, if a gravitational wave is going through the Earth and hits Washington first, it will go through the Earth, and it will go out through Louisiana 10, 10 microseconds later, or sorry, 10 milliseconds later. So if you look at the hand, if you look for things in Hanford, Washington, and look for things in Livingston, Louisiana, Louisiana, and and change them by tenth one by 10 milliseconds, and you look for something that's exactly the same in both, except it occurs in one detector 10 milliseconds before the other. Then you've detected a signal from outer space, and that's what was seen. And what was seen was, the, was two black holes colliding in a galaxy several billion light years away. And if you look at the next image, it's an amazing, this is an artist's representation. If you could see it, click here. These two, these two black holes, click please, they're one is, one is 36 times the mass of the sun, and one is 20, 29 times the mass of the sun. They're actually orbiting around each other several hundred times every second. It's hard to believe such things happen in space. And space behind them is getting lens. So if you could see it, you'd see this. This is an Argent's representation. But when they merge, watch what happens to space. See the jitter? That's a gravitational wave. And that's what was observed in two-tenths of a second in September of 2015. And the experimenters who observed that, of course, won the Nobel Prize a few, a few years later. Gravitational waves are now part of our observational cadre of the universe. But it turns out the gravitational waves that are really of interest to us are not those, but something that comes from the beginning of time. And we wouldn't see them with the LIGO detector, but we'd see them with another detector. If we can go to the next slide. And we're almost done. This is an observatory at the South Pole. It's actually looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation. I love this picture. It turns out, by the way, that in order to look at this, you have to cool it down to a temperature that's very cold. If you go to the next slide. Here's in the summertime in, in Antarctica at the South Pole, we deliver liquid, liquid helium. Because the South Pole isn't cold enough, even in the winter. It's not cold enough to do this experiment. You couldn't do it in Moscow, even though Moscow was pretty darn cold in the winter. You need to cool down that, uh, that, that antenna with liquid helium. And then you can very carefully measure the microwave background. Now, it turns out, by the way, we can only deliver liquid helium to the South Pole in the summertime. I didn't know that until a few years ago, because it's too cold for planes to fly. So if you're down there in the, at the beginning of the winter, you have to stay there the whole winter. So go to this next image. It's one of my favorite images, because it's a picture of sunset at the South Pole. Now, the sun only sets once a year at the South Pole, because for the rest of the winter, it's dark. So if you're the one who took this picture, you're stuck there for the whole winter. And that's why this picture was probably taken by a graduate student. 
because they're the ones who, who winter down. But recently, uh, uh, experiments have been designed to look at this microwave background, and it turns out there would be a signal in this microwave background, not from black holes colliding since that background was created, but from the beginning of time. Because inflation itself is a violent event when the whole universe expands and gravitational waves would be created from the beginning of time. If you go to the next, next image, go to the next slide. It's a picture I created for a Scientific American article, and it's just too complicated for me to describe now. But if inflation happened, it would produce gravitational waves, and we may be able to detect them in the microwave background. In my lifetime, we may be able to detect gravitational waves from the beginning of time. And that would prove that inflation happened. And that would be remarkable. So go to the next slide. Click on it. As I said to you earlier, inflation will force the universe to appear flatter. And click again. And thus, the only universe that can have been created from nothing and survived this long is one that looks flat, just like the universe we live in. And therefore, if we, if we observe the universe to be flat, which we have, and if we can show inflation happened, it would validate the notion that our universe could easily be created from absolutely nothing. It's the ultimate free lunch. You start with no space, you create space, inflation happens, and it produces the universe we see without any supernatural shenanigans. And I find, now this, we haven't proved this to be the case, but it's plausible. And I find that plausibility remarkable because any time you can get rid of a vague claim of the supernatural and God and show that simple laws of physics can produce the same thing, we've progressed. Now, some people will say that that kind of nothing, a universe with no space and no time suddenly appearing and then producing a universe with a hundred billion galaxies, that kind of nothing is not nothing because there's still laws of physics. So let's go to the next slide. But maybe even the law, click on the, click on that slide. But maybe even the laws of physics are accidental. Because, go to the next slide. Because are you, next slide please. Our universe was, as I, what looks like it was created in that inflationary event, but it turns out other universes could be maybe being created by inflation right now in spaces we can't even see. And it turns out, after inflation ends in each universe, the laws of physics could be different in each universe. And then the laws of physics in our universe might just be an accident. And there could be some universes in which the laws of physics are such that no galaxies are created. And then there are universes in which the laws of physics are such that galaxies would be created. And we can ask ourselves, which universe would we live in? Well, obviously, we're in the universe in which galaxies are created. So the laws of physics that we see may not be fundamental. They could just be an accident of our existence. And then the laws of physics are accidental, and all the different kinds of laws of physics occur, and they are just what they are because we hap happen to live in the universe in which we live. That could be the case. And some people don't like that, but the wonderful thing about our universe is it doesn't give a damn, damn about what we like and what we don't like. So what I'm saying is that ultimately every different type of nothing is possible and something can come from it. Material can come from empty space, universes can be created from nothing, and even the laws of physics can spontaneously appear when our universe appears. So go to the next slide. Well, okay, the next slide. In a way, this is answering Einstein's question. He once, Einstein once gave a quote, and if you click, please. He said, what really interests me is whether God had any choice in the creation of the universe. And by God, he didn't mean God. Unfortunately, a lot of people think he was religious, but he wasn't. But what he really meant here was, are the laws of physics unique? If you twiddle the one dial in the laws of physics, would our universe disappear? Or could the laws of physics be anything and any possible universe could exist? 
And what's amazing is we're on the threshold of answering Einstein's question. Because if we measure that inflation happened, we will know that potentially other universes could exist and that there may be other laws of physics and that the laws of physics in our universe is an accident. And once again, God is irrelevant because every different kind of laws of physics exists. You don't need God to create them and you certainly don't need God to create a universe. So, next slide. The last thing is, if I haven't depressed you enough about the fact that most of the mass of our universe resides in empty space, and therefore you're even more insignificant than you were when we learned about dark matter, because if you look out at our universe, and you look at all the stars and galaxies we see, that's 1% of the total energy of the universe. You get, and everything we see and the universe will be largely the same. We're an insignificant bit of noise of pollution in a universe made of dark matter and dark energy. We are irrelevant. So, so much for a universe made for us. But it's even worse. Now that we know the universe is dominated by dark energy, we can think of the future. Go to the next slide. And the future is miserable. It's one of the last thing I wanted to tell you. The first moral of this talk is that you are insignificant. And the second is that the future is miserable. Click, please. George Orwell, who wrote the book 1984, said, to see what is in front of one's nose requires a constant struggle. And this is clearly what he meant by it. Click again. Well, I don't expect you to understand that, but, but it, click again. But what it means is that if we're in a universe that's expanding ever faster and faster, then objects that we can now see will one day be moving away from us faster than light. And that means the longer we wait, the less we will see. And eventually, everything in our universe will disappear. The longer we wait, the less we'll see. And eventually, the universe, all the galaxies we now see, all 100 billion galaxies we now see out there, will eventually be moving away from us faster than light. Light will not be able to get to us. The universe will become cold, dark, and empty. Cl click again, please. It doesn't really matter. Go to the next slide. The rest of the universe will disappear. And then it turns out if you ask the question, go to the next slide. Click. Watch something rather than nothing. As my good friend, when I first explained this to my friend, the late Christopher Hitchens, who many of you may, you may have heard of, who was, a, who was a wonderful writer and also an atheist. When I first told him about this, and, and he said the, right, the, the answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is something different than everyone else thinks. Click again. The answer is, there won't be for long. Namely, we happen to live in a brief moment in the cosmic expansion when there are lots of galaxies. But eventually, the, all those galaxies will disappear. And all the stars in our galaxy will burn out. And the universe will become cold, dark, and empty. And that is the future that we think the universe has. And therefore, the universe in the far future will largely be empty space, once again. And this motion of something, all the galaxies we see, would just be a quaint question that people who live at our time in the history of the universe would ask. But at the beginning there was nothing, and in the end there'll be nothing. So go to the next slide. The question, why is there something rather than nothing, may not be the interesting question there. The interesting question, if you go to the next slide, rather is, can we understand how from nothing we get to this amazing universe with 100 billion galaxies, 100 billion stars? And the fact that we've come this far, if you go to the next slide, to me represents humanity at its best. We've been willing to throw aside dogma and superstition and recognize that we may be insignificant and there may be no purpose to the universe but we shouldn't be depressed go to the next slide we may instead realize that we are here for a brief moment and that life exists for a brief moment in a purposeless universe that was not designed for us 
that was created from nothing without any supernatural shenanigans. But just like this beautiful image of, this, of a solar eclipse, we should enjoy our brief moment in the sun and not be depressed. Go to the next slide. We should take a poetic view. And we should say the fairest, like Einstein said, the fairest thing we can experience is the mysterious. It's the fundamental that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. And we have this cosmic mystery we're trying to solve. We don't know for sure that inflation happened, but it's plausible. And we are trying to find out, and we're willing to accept any answer, and we're willing to accept a universe, a miserable, cold, dark universe in which we are insignificant. Because, as once I said before, the universe doesn't care about us. We make our own meaning, and I urge each of you to make your own meaning and enjoy the universe for the way it is, whether we like it or not. Thank you very much. Спасибо. Okay, thank you.